Hi and welcome to the Sonji Land show where everybody's upside down. Every day is upside down in Sonji Land. And today I have a guest <laughs> with the with the most beautiful beard I've ever seen. Uh, well, I think you all know Yuri Marmerstein. Is that actually how you say it? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I have to say much about him because we all know he's an acrobat and hand balancer and he has been teaching for a long time and I think he's one of the most um, valued trainers out there. So we're just going to dive right in and I'm going to ask you how this all started. How did you get into hand balancing, acrobatics and why? Why is, why is a good question. Initially, it was just something I thought I would be interested in, so I, I wasn't super athletic as a kid, but I played some sports, and I would say towards the end of high school, I played soccer, and I got into just like juggling, you know, and doing tricks as opposed to like playing the actual sport and caring about the team aspect of it, and then from there, I got into kind of backyard martial arts, and then from there, I kind of got into more basic fitness stuff, and at that point, most of the books on fitness were from the 1900s. So it was a lot of like old school body weight stuff and they did handstands. So from there it pursued me, I pursued um, just more basic body weight strength and all of that and backyard martial arts. When I got into college, I started doing capoeira and that wasn't even legitimate. That was, I learned from a dancer who learned from playing Tekken, which is a fighting video game. I know. <laughs> yeah. So, but from there I kept going and luckily I didn't have, you know, too many responsibilities or social life or anything like that. Uh -huh. So I just got super obsessed. I trained a lot. Um, and again, I just did it for personal interest. I didn't know that it could be a business or it could be a work prospect. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I think this is cool. I want to do something with it. I don't want to run on the fitness hamster wheel. I want to actually get better at stuff and learn skills. Right. And I guess some degree of that was probably like, well, what if it counteracts my social awkwardness because I can do cool stuff? It didn't, but... <laughs> But it's all good. And then from there, it's interesting, I started teaching not because I necessarily wanted to, but because the Eddie Gordo guy, he had some issues with his family or something, so he left the second year of college. So I was kind of the most most advanced student. I don't even want to use that terminology because I was nothing. Oh, uh, wait, okay, who's Eddie Gordo? So, no, Eddie Gordo, sorry, this is the character <laughs> from Tekken that did oh, Capoeira. Yeah. And that's, um, and I learned from a dance student who learned from Eddie Gordo who is actually motion captured by an actual master who lives out in Oakland, I think. Oh, but interesting. Basically, the second year, this guy left, and I was kind of the most advanced, like most dedicated student. So uh -huh. I took over teaching, and for me, it was more, it was an unofficial club, so it was just for my own interest, just kind of to have, to try to create a community and to try to have other people mm -hmm. with similar interests to train with. Um, you know, it was like a party college, so it was usually kind of a skeleton crew, but... But that was how I started teaching, and it wasn't even like I was at a level necessarily that I should have been teaching, but hmm. it was, I guess, for my own personal gain to have other people to train with, and teaching gives you a different access to the learning process, mm -hmm. so you can learn more about your own skills and progressions by teaching. Interesting. How has your teaching evolved over time? It's one of the more difficult things since I started doing it for a living. I think in 2013 I quit my jobs. And I started doing whatever it is okay, I wait, did full time. Which other jobs did you do? Uh, Where did you come from originally, professional life? So I went to school for physics, nothing fancy, just like a bachelor's degree. Um, out of school, I had a, I guess what would be considered a good job by some people. I was doing environmental testing for radiation detectors as part of a government project. That actually sounds so interesting. It sounds interesting, and, and in theory it might have been, but then in practice it was... I was working long hours mm. and I didn't really have time to do what I was actually interested in. So it was a very, it was a difficult life and especially I was 21, 22. So I had a lot of energy, like I wanted to train and do stuff and I was right. stuck in the office in the lab for 60, 80 hours a week. I can totally feel and it. Yeah. Luckily I was getting paid for it. So it, it helped a lot, but it gave me a good taste of the corporate world that I know I didn't want to come back from. Mm -hmm. So after kind of that contract was up, I got into coaching gymnastics, even though I was never a gymnast. How just, did that happen? Well, the thing is, in America, the way a lot of businesses are made is that you don't have to necessarily be like a, a good athlete because recreational sports are really big. Right. So basically, I, I had a, you know, I did college cheerleading as well, so I had kind of that on my resume, and I had some experience. 
and a lot of gyms will hire people without a whole lot of experience just because it, like they can learn on the fly mm -hmm. and with a lot of gymnastics gyms as well they kind of need fit people to spot some of the kids mm -hmm. sometimes the owners are, are not as you know not in shape to mm -hmm. spot some of the, the bigger kids that need spotting so started coaching gymnastics and it was kind of the opposite work-wise it was part-time you know like maybe 25 30 hours a week uh, much less pay mm -hmm. but at the same time I got, had the time to train I had the opportunity to be more around kind of what I was interested in mm -hmm. so it was really interesting transition where even though I guess technically professionally it was considered worse and you know my family was on my case as well but to me it was actually a more fulfilling life because I got to even though I was less financially stable, I got to do what interested me. This is really interesting. Uh, what did your family say about you taking up this kind of profession? Um, I mean, they're very, they're more open about it now, I guess, because they've kind of saw the direction that I've gone to. But I was very much black sheep, kind of going against the status quo, which is, again, right, everybody's supposed to, it's like the life. You finish school and then you go to college and then you get uh -huh. your degree and you get a job and you work and you buy a house and you have a family and then that's like, I, I don't know, I guess I just wasn't interested in that. I wanted to do something different and mm -hmm. I wanted to, yeah, just pursue what I actually wanted to pursue, even if it meant, so can yeah. I know, can I know yeah. what your parents did? They are, so my dad is a computer programmer and my mom is a chemist huh. um, and then, yeah, so it's. More is that where you get your uh, analytical side from? Uh, I don't think so. I think I've just always kind of spent a lot of time alone as a kid, so I had time to really think and process mm. stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, I guess the science training in college, but I've, I've always kind of thought thought deeply about stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so it sounds like um, you kind of slipped into this whole world. Um, in my opinion, you're a pretty good all-rounder, like in general terms of movement. Um, has Hand balancing in specific ever been something that you were like really hooked on or was it just a byproduct of you doing everything and, and trying out new stuff? So it's a good question. Initially I did a bit of everything and I did like flips and I did martial arts and then hand balancing was part of that because I get like my big inspirations in the days were the old school strongmen and they all wrote like handstands are a great display of body control. Hmm. Of course, the, te the technique they used isn't as... It's still applicable today, but, you know, I did banana back for a while and all of that. Nothing wrong with it. Um, huh, you did that for a well, while? Well, I did banana back for at least five years before I even learned how to start making it straight. It was just, again, okay, back I'm gonna then... I'm going to hold that thought just yeah. in case I, I forget about it, but I would like to know how you transitioned from the banana back. Well, we to all follow our, our own journeys, but a big part of it was just there weren't... Like, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram. Uh -huh. I would look up on the internet, hand balancing, and it would be like, oh, this Sandow book from 1920. Uh -huh. And all of the handstands they did were banana back, so I just kind of echoed that. So, I mean, even in the world of gymnastics and circus and all of that, you won't see the straight handstand come into the scene until maybe, like, late 60s, early 70s. Right. So even in that scene, it's still relatively new. Mm -hmm. It's just that the way the media has defined a handstand is what it's supposed to be. So The obsess obsessiveness about yeah. the line. <laughs> and it's it can be a lot of different things. So what was the question we're talking about? If it was a byproduct of you doing yes. everything, yeah. So initially, yes, and then I worked on it. So maybe it took me a year to get like a, a steady handstand of training it. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I didn't know what I was doing, so it was just kicking up, falling over. I fell on my back a lot. Mm. I was young and uh, and I didn't care that much. I was kind of immune to the pain, but I did a lot of falling. I did a lot of walking as well, so I could walk with kind of like really sloppy form for a while. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, after about a year into it, it started to click the idea of gripping the floor and balancing. So initially, it was a byproduct of all the stuff I was doing, and then I started to take it more seriously, and then I started to work longer holds and different leg positions and presses. And again, for the first five years, because YouTube didn't come on the scene until maybe 2006, I want to say, um, but even then there wasn't like hand balancing material on YouTube, mm -hmm. let's say until 2008, 2009, uh, other than a couple videos. So yeah, most of the stuff that I was doing was still kind of old school strongman. And then my own mistakes and experience were the only guidance I had. You know, once in a while I would meet a gymnast. And it would be like, because I never had that background, so I would think like, oh my God, you have to, you're amazing, tell me all your secrets. And most of the time they were kind of, 
not that engaged because I understand now where they come from because they do the sport and it's work for them. So when they get out of the sport, it's not something they pursue as much mm-hmm. just because of kind of the, the psychology of usually being a child gymnast. Um, so I know it was interesting for me that every time I would meet someone who could do like anything related or, or any kind of gymnastics background, I would try to, maybe I was too excited. Maybe I, I came off as too strong, but to me it was like, I never had the opportunity even to train with someone who could do this. It was like, I want to know everything. Mm-hmm. Most of the time it was That's disappointing. <laughs> Most of the time people that were, you know, ex-gymnasts or, like, wouldn't really do much. Mm-hmm. And uh, coming where I come from now, I understand a lot more of that. Mm-hmm. But back then, because I, I was so enthusiastic and so obsessed with this stuff, I was like, what? You can do these flips and handstands? How do you not just do them all the time? Yeah. yeah. So initially, it was a byproduct of just random stuff I did the handstand. And then eventually, I did take time to really focus on it. And once I got more serious and trained one arm, then it was a, a major focus for a few years. Did you ever get coached by anybody? Not on any like consistent basis. I never had anybody that was a coach. I know in college, that was kind of one of the things that I wish I had, just someone, I wish I had less of an ego to listen to advice, but also at the same time, you know, we're all learning, like we're all amateurs. So somebody does something, they're like, yeah, bro, that was sick. That was awesome. And it was a lot of that and not in any bad way, but now it's like, I almost have such a high standard for myself. If somebody gives me a compliment, I'll immediately put it down and say, no, no way that could be good because I know it can be better. So kind of as a remnant of that. So I've worked and I've learned from a lot of people, like more than I can count, more than I can list, uh, both directly and indirectly. Mm -hmm. I've never had any regular kind of coach, I'd say. But that isn't to say that I haven't worked with and learned from a lot of people. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Did you program your own training? Did you have a system or how did you go about it? So that's a good question. No. Well, eventually I did but I wouldn't like to call it a system. Mm -hmm. So when I was first learning one arms, I would just do them. There wasn't much of like a warm up. It was just like, just do them and then do them whenever. And I was also young enough that I probably didn't need as much warm up, though I probably would have been better off doing it. Uh, So, and I got to a- You put a lot of emphasis on warm up now, right? That's because uh, now I'm an old man. So now I have to, Ah, (laughs) I have to think about the old man warm up. Yeah, so initially it wasn't that. I remember when I was like really focused in Ohio on handstands, I would do three sessions a day for a while, maybe lasting maybe 45 minutes each. And mm-hmm. it wasn't too much warm. It was like maybe one set, just you know, hold on two arms, and then just over and over, try to shift to one arm, sometimes hold, sometimes mm-hmm. fall, sometimes fingertips. Um, eventually I started to understand kind of more, I don't want to say understand because that's a very... Uh, I feel like it's a pretentious term because I'm still learning more about (laughs) understanding it, but I started to understand more of what goes into it. So then I would start to think like, okay, long holds, working on alignment, working on these shoulder drills, working Mm -hmm. on leg tilts, working on presses, like all of that basic stuff. How does that also coordinate into one arm balance? Mm -hmm. And it does. If you only work on it, you won't get the one arm, but if you only do one arms, you might be missing a lot of potential Mm-hmm. strength and control from it so then once I was training on my own in Vegas I had a better then I had like a and I would train every day for you know two two and a half hours mm-hmm. at least six days a week when I was really focused on it so then I would have a more particular sequence that I would do so I would do my warm-up my two-arm warm-up which would include like basics that I'm trying to refine and then a couple of drills that I'm working on mm-hmm. so it would be I started to do this in Ohio as well but it evolved a lot more uh, within a couple of years of my practice in Vegas. So it would be like maybe warm up with a couple of basic holds, maybe against the wall, then freestanding, mm-hmm. then maybe some head movement, then some leg movements, then some presses, then some one-arm conditioning like flag mm-hmm. side to side, maybe some basic just like walking back and forth on the hands. Mm-hmm. So I would have a handstand warm up, then I would have a one-arm warm up, basic technical stuff, and then I would have the one-arm practice, and then I would have the conditioning and endurance at the end. So mm-hmm. there was a time where it was very structured, and it, it's kind of gone away from that now, but I, I will say What does your that, training look like now? Oh, it's hard to say because I'm doing a lot of different stuff and a lot of the time I don't really know what to train. And then when I'm on the road, kind of all of that gets completely lost. So when I'm on the road, it's more like try not to get too out of shape so that when I come back, I can get into my training protocol. 
But because yeah. I'm doing capoeira, I'm trying to do dance, I'm doing other martial arts stuff, mm-hmm. I'm trying to include handstands, but I'm doing less. And this year I had a wrist injury, so it kind of limited a bit of my handstand practice. Hmm. But it, it did help, I think, with my teaching practice a lot, just going through that injury. What exactly did it change? Um, just how to approach it and this idea. It's something I've talked about before, but I got to witness it a lot more now. But I haven't had a proper wrist injury probably in like seven or eight years. It was the same wrist, of course. So there's already some damage there. Mm. So this idea of a compensation pattern. You injure something and your body gets really smart at getting away from it while still being able to do the basic task. So, mm-hmm. And I was still teaching handstands, of course, so I had to do some demonstrations. I felt very, like, very disappointed in myself for the demonstrations that I did, but I'm sure people understood. So the first compensation would be that I couldn't do a handstand with straight arms. Because mm-hmm. it put pressure, it was on this part of my wrist, so if I bend the arm, it puts pressure on this part, and I could get away from from putting pressure on that point that I needed. And then once I was better enough that I could start to straighten my arm, I developed a bit of a lean to the right side to get away from, and it's my dominant side anyway, but to get away from that wrist injury. So it's interesting that I'm just now at the point where I don't have to consciously tell myself to be centered, mm-hmm. where my handstand is more centered now after the wrist injury. So, and then how to approach it and, you know, different things I did, what I did that made it worse, what I did that made it better, how to still be able to approach the training. Mm -hmm. So I feel like even though I've actually gotten worse at handstands this year because of not being able to practice, as a teacher, it made me grow a lot more because I I could see a different side of the training. Hmm. I mean, I remember uh, I went to your workshop, I went to his workshop what was it, three years ago? Two years ago. Two it years? In March 2016. It was my very, very first handstand workshop, and I wasn't able to hold a handstand yet. Uh, and I just remember now, comparing it to other workshops I went to, um, that you focus a lot on rehab and prehab, but you already did back then. I found that really interesting. Um, how has the feedback been from people about injuries? So it, it's really interesting because I have usually a mixed group, so I'm pretty sure that at least some of the more advanced people get... An- and it, it's an open workshop, so it's not like I mandate that everyone has to do the same thing. Some people learn better by doing their own thing and listening, and that's mm-hmm. a lot of times I find myself doing that in workshops. Like I just go off in the corner, do my mm-hmm. thing, I listen, and watch people, okay, that's interesting. Huh. So okay. some people I think have never even warmed up their wrists, uh-huh. and you know this basic, like you go to a gymnastics class for kids... Very basic, but the kids don't really need it because their bodies are still developing. Yeah. Um, But maybe they do need it because when they get older, they get, they start to get some pain as well. So the wrists are probably going to be the biggest physical uh, limitation for people. Like if your shoulders don't open completely, you can still do a handstand. If you're, you know, you can't get your ribs in, you can still do a handstand. If your wrists are fucked up, you can't do a handstand. So that's something that has to be addressed. That's something most Very kind of teachers point. and methods mm-hmm. kind of brush over. And the hands are super complicated. Even without finger articulation, the wrist moves in three dimensions. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot that can go into that. And I know it took me getting injured a couple of times to really start to think seriously about warm-up and prehab. The other issue is that adults learning for the first time, they're going to acclimate their bodies a lot slower Mm -hmm. and the wrist is going to take a long time to acclimate. So it's important to put it in these positions that helps to make it stronger for the practice. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then likewise, I have a pretty mixed group. So beginners need more preparation. And likewise, a beginner can't, when I taught handstand classes in Vegas, let's say you have an hour class, someone who's just starting handstands might only be able to handle 20 minutes of handstands with good form. Right. So how can we improve the skill itself without doing the skill? So we have to think of what attributes are important. And that's the big one is really spending time on wrist. And a lot of the feedback I get from people, especially people who are older and don't have a lot of experience, is say, I thought my wrist would feel shitty and they didn't. Thanks for all the wrist warm-up. Great. That's good to hear. That's interesting too. Because uh, when I started really um, taking the training seriously yeah. and doing it every day, my pinky was numb for about three months, I think, two months maybe. So yeah, that's probably something I should have taken into account more. Yeah, and it was the same when I first, like, I remember when I was 19, I hurt my back and my my thought process was, I'll just keep training until my back doesn't hurt. Mm-hmm. And if I did that <laughs> now, I don't think, 
Yeah, so you're saying now. age plays a role too, of course. Yeah, and um, so when you're a kid, you don't have to worry about this idea of physical acclimation because the body's still growing. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of very high-level hand balancers basically do this and they're jumping on one hand because they've already built that structure in their body to be able to take it. Mm -hmm. You have to, as an adult starting out, you have to be very conscious of the physical limitations. And it's not just the wrist. Sometimes people go into it too fast. A big part of handstands is a lot of people tend to planche without knowing. Mm -hmm. So it's not even so much that their wrists can't handle it. It's that they're doing the skills in a way that are putting their wrists in a more compromised more position. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to put most of my weight on my heel when I'm balancing. And all of my wrist injuries have been from trauma. So I've never had... Yeah, I've had some wrist pain when I was doing a lot of handstands, but never... I've never had a wrist injury from handstands. Every wrist injury that I've had has been from a landing or from, like, I hit a punching bag this year. Mm -hmm. So it's always been from some kind of traumatic incident as opposed yeah. to overuse. And the good thing, too, is because there's so many nerve endings in the wrist, you'll usually get feedback. And if you learn how to listen to it, you can modify. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, parallettes is a really simple way to modify basic handstand practice. Mm -hmm. And I know that's something, the wrist injuries that I had in the past, I would still try to do it on parallettes or on an incline. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. The big part of it is just awareness. Like you have to know what's happening, so you have to be sensitive to certain sensations. Mm -hmm. But with the wrist warm up that I do as well, it also helps with the balance because you get more sensitivity of what's happening in the hands, and then you have a better idea of how to change the weight distribution. This reminds me of your book, Balancing the Equation. I loved it. Um, how did you come up with this approach? Did you base it on your experience or did you also do some research about uh, theoretical stuff? No, it was all, it was my experience of training and my experience of teaching. And it's interesting that it still applies now, but I think I wrote this before, or no, no it was a couple of years after because I actually rewrote it several times. I wrote the first draft in 2012. Oh, you did? Um, I scrapped about four drafts of it, like completely deleted. So it was... actually took you like six years to really no, come up with a final like version to publish? it took me like two or three years. Ah. I think, let's say three years. I, I remember I got the initial idea from for writing it from somebody else who wanted mm -hmm. to like help monetize it. And <laughs> it took too long. So he ended up backing out. He was like, this is taking too long. Sorry, bro. Like you're on your own. <laughs> um, and it, what ended up happening is... There's a lot of things I wanted to put into it that I didn't because of the communication of how can we communicate this effectively through text in a way that gives less artistic interpretation. Mm -hmm. So I can say a lot of things, but how people interpret it is going to be something different. So but I was that's very always going to be the case, right? I tried to be very careful with specifically the language that I use, so it was more... Of course, of course, it's it going to have interpretations, but yeah, I tried to make it more clear. So I think I scrapped... Like, I looked at it, and then I completely deleted it, and I rewrote it, I want to say, three or four times for the wow. final product. <laughs> the second book is going a bit better, because now I have a more idea. Uh, I've been writing a lot more, so it's more fresh, but, yeah. Uh, What's took, the second book going to be about? It's going to be basically the next, so Balancing the Equation talks about the basic handstand and the basic science behind balance and how to develop the sensations. The one-minute handstand, that's a goal, right? Yeah. Uh, the second book is more about the next level, so getting into different entries, different surfaces, different apparatus, mm -hmm. getting into leg positions, movement, presses, handstand push-ups, Mexican handstand, so kind of like intermediate level balance. Which seems very challenging because it's a lot more complex. It's hard and I'm trying to be very direct with the progressions. Mm -hmm. I'm trying not to go on too many tangents and say like, realistically to get a press, I could give you 50 different exercises to do, but let's be realistic, you can get the most out of it by just trying to press, but doing it in a way that challenges you, that you, if you just fail and fall, it's not helping, but if, if you're just not leaning over enough, it's not helping either. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to kind of, uh, what's the word, categorize it between things that directly are the movement, or some variation mm -hmm. of the movement, and then assistance work where, okay, in a press, if you have more flexible hips and stronger shoulders, it's going to help your press, but it's not doing the press. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, trying not to just list a shitload of exercises, but trying to be very direct and precise with the... Methodical. Yeah, because there's already so many books that list exercises. It's not about that. I'm trying to be uh, precise with, yeah, with the 
the theory behind it, with the mm-hmm. philosophy, with not just repeating what's already been said. That's to me is really important. Yeah. Making sure that it comes <laughs> from my own experiences and not regurgitating. Yeah. Yeah. Is there going to be a one arm book afterwards too? Yeah. So I have the one arm article, which is a, I, it doesn't go into too many details, but it goes into a lot more details than some other stuff that I've mm-hmm. seen. Uh, but eventually, I do want to make a full one arm book. And again, it's not it's just my perspective. I know that I'm not the best. This is just hopefully helps people understand it in a different way. Mm-hmm. What does your future look like in your head? Where do you want to go with your career, if I can call it your career? I don't look that far ahead. <laughs> I'm hoping I can sustain it a bit longer. The market's kind of getting saturated. There's a lot of handstand teachers now. So huh. I would say that I probably got lucky with when I started putting stuff out hmm. because it was before the algorithms of the Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and I would say I got very lucky with timing because I was kind of like, I guess, second internet generation, which would have been first social media generation. Mm-hmm. If I like, think about the different kind of teachers and, and writers, and so you have the pre-internet generation, then you have the pre-social media generation where it was like mailing lists and PDF yeah. books and all of that. Then the social media, there's a few generations. So I was like first, I was in the scene pre-social media, but I didn't start to teach until kind of after social media, but it was still relatively new back then. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how it goes. I want to put out more instructional materials, you know, more mm-hmm. eBooks. I want to do a flexibility eBook as well, because I've had, you know, mm-hmm. I've had a response for that. Uh-huh. I want to do more instructional videos on Vimeo. I would love to, I'd love to travel less I can do workshops, but maybe not all the time, consolidate them more so I don't have to like risk going somewhere and then not even having that many people show up. Well, you have like the best space here in your living yeah, room. Yeah, so once we get that set up, that's going to be workshop space. There's also a park, five minute walk, uh-huh. a lot of grass, well maintained grass. Uh-huh. So it's not like dry, it's not like For this. tumbling, yeah. yeah. So just that, it's going to be good. Yeah, so I want to continue teaching. I'd like to not travel as much, and I'd like to pursue other interests. Mm-hmm. Um, like what? Just different stuff. I've been trying to do... Like I, I would love to perform more. I've been getting into a bit of film work and stunt work recently as well. Nothing too heavy, nothing too serious, but to me that's interesting. Um, I wish I had more development as a performer. It's just we can't do everything at once. So I like, and I've told people this before, you know, people that say like, oh, I want to be like you, is that I never even had the intention to be a teacher. That was never, like, I never wrote down my goals on a piece of paper and yeah. said, I want to teach all over the world. Yeah. That was kind of something that fell into me. And there was a point where I saw an opportunity and I went with it. So it's like I was treading water and then a wave came. So like, okay, I'll swim with this wave. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing that. Hmm. I'd love to perform more. I'd love to get into more film work. Um, just want to do stuff that I can learn from and be interested in so I I like the teaching side of things I like the physical practice it's something that I'll continue doing for the rest of my life it just depends on where I go with it like even just this idea of now that I'm teaching as a business my trainings changed a lot compared to when I just trained for the purpose of only getting better oh really because part of it is I mean, I have to, it's not glamorous, like I'm not going to, I'm going to post a pretty handstand picture on the internet, but I'm not going to post a picture of me on the computer answering emails, but I'd probably do that more often than doing handstands right. in the nature. Yeah. There's a lot of planning that goes on. There's a lot of, and I guess creating social media content, so it's, I'll train, but I think like, okay, I should probably film something from this training mm-hmm. because I need to post something because the social media is hungry. It's always hungry and it's hard. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to be able to Especially turn it off. Especially with you. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to be able to turn it off and say like, okay, I just want to train and not even care what happens. Mm. And there's still elements of that, but then I get into this, like, okay, I'm doing good shit. I should film it. And then I film it and it's not as good <laughs> maybe because the camera was on, maybe because it wasn't that good in the first place and I only saw how bad it was when I filmed it. <laughs> it's just, I, I guess it's kind of like it's good to produce content because more people see it and you reach more people. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's kind of its own black hole is not the right word, but it, it sucks a lot of energy out of the training as well. And of mm-hmm. course, traveling, it's like I just got back from, I think, 12 days of travel, which isn't that long. But mm-hmm. it was just nonstop either teaching or doing stuff with my family. So it's like in that 12 days, I had no rest. So when I got home yesterday, <laughs> I did not. I just slept all day. And I felt bad for doing it, but it's like, it's just what my body needed. Yeah, absolutely. It's very draining. 
Yeah, I bet. Um, but you have a lot of workshops coming up in Europe, right? Yeah, I don't even know if it's too many. It's just a, things happen. <laughs> it's hard to say no. You're just going to be exhausted. Well, I mean, well, it's good no, for your no, business, right? I've, I've learned a lot also. I know now um, kind of my limit for sanity as far as traveling goes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'll be doing any more like super long trips. Just because usually at about two, three weeks, I start to hit like my I don't care phase. <laughs> Uh, so I'm keeping my trips a bit shorter, a bit more consolidated. But yeah, it's hard. I guess it's, and I get messages from people all the time that I guess don't realize it's not just like I'm on a vacation all the time. I'm like, oh, let's do a workshop. You, like, right. you get a workshop, you get a workshop. Yeah. No, it you takes a lot of planning. Right. Workshop. Like it's a business trip. So it's cool that I get to travel and absolutely I do some stuff and I see, but it's not like I'm paying for my travels mm -hmm. and it's something that I'm doing to make a profit so it's not like I just travel for fun mm -hmm. and to do that it takes a lot of planning and it's it's a lot more than just announcing a workshop and then showing up yeah and sometimes it doesn't go as planned and that's part of the business too is sometimes you book a trip and you don't get enough people and then you have to find a contingency yeah or like sometimes travel changes last summer is it last summer yeah right uh, three weeks of my travel, I had a seven-week tour, and three weeks of that got completely fucked because Scotland decided not to let me in. Because they threw me out, yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, what do you do with that? So it's, I mean, part of it, I'm not complaining. I actually like that part of it because the chaos forces you to adapt. Mm -hmm. And I know other jobs that I've had, once you do it for a while, you get into the pattern and you get to the rhythm, mm -hmm. and then you stop learning new things because you make it automatic. So the good thing about what I'm doing now is that it's constantly changing, constantly yeah. evolving. So if I don't evolve with it, like, and it's good because I don't like to do the same thing. Yeah. If I get too used to doing the same thing, even if it works, I'll change things up just for chaos. Mm -hmm. Like I cook a recipe, I follow the recipe somewhat closely the first time. After that, I never make the same thing twice. I always change a little bit because even if it turns out good, I don't know, I don't think it'd be better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not better. Sometimes it's worse, but... Just but the I, change alone. I like to experiment. I like to know that that if you could make something different, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting thought. And same thing with my workshops. Like I've, I mean, it's been similar workshops, of course, because it's the same topics and similar material. But I've changed my perspective on it. I've changed my approach. I get different groups, mm -hmm. and I'm experimenting all the time as well with kind of how I present things, different drills that I do. Mm -hmm. So it's a good and a bad thing. I always encourage people to come back and I give them a discount because you probably won't be coming back to the same workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep it interesting. And it's interesting for me. Like I'll intentionally as well, within the group, I'll try to pick the most uncoordinated person in the group to try to spot mm -hmm. because I want to put myself on the spot to see if I can create a solution. That's pretty cool. Just creating different levels of chaos. Yeah. Cause I, and I've been to a lot of workshops and classes that are rehearsed. I don't think it's a bad thing by any means. It's good, like, you know, you get a product from the factory, you know that the products are very similar because they're made by the factory, but I like having the option to fail. And when I watch someone teaching or performing, it's the same thing. It makes it interesting when you don't know what's going to happen. There might be an option for failure, and I think it's more exciting that way. Absolutely. I'm on the same page as you are in that sense. Awesome. Hey, so many great informations. And thank you so much for being on the show. We didn't answer anyone's questions on the internet. They weren't good questions. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> They're always the same. One questions. was about shoulder flexibility. <laughs> right. um, go, yeah, I have a rubber band sequence that I use in my own training more than anything. Bottom line is you have it all on your website, right? Yeah. Wow. Well, Which I need I'm going to put the better. link down below. Other question was strength for one arm handstand. It's a trick question. You don't have to be strong to do one arm handstand if you do it right. But you have to learn the technique, which is a very specific strength. Uh, take a workshop. <laughs> you learn a lot more, basically. Yeah. Visit his website. Um, you'll also find the dates for his workshops there. And I'll put the link down below. And I'm, I need to get better at promoting. I have a one week, I don't know what it's called, journey, retreat, intensive coming up in Costa Rica. Oh, cool. That's like it's my first time doing that. So I'm trying to start promoting it more because I had to put down a deposit. So if nobody shows up, and I'll just <laughs> oh, go to Costa Rica by myself. Talking but, about hassles. But basically... When is it going to be? I'm so bad at this. Last weekend, last week of March, 23rd to the 30th, 
it's all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to get to Costa Rica, but then like transportation, lodging, mm -hmm. food is all included. It's going to be probably two sessions a day, training, time to relax. So that's the other thing is when I do a weekend, it can be very stressful. It's a lot for me and for the people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of information. It's a lot of training in a very short you time. You can't really absorb it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's not much room for repetition either. So with the Costa Rica thing, it's more information, better absorption, and then more time in between to just like chill out and take naps. Sounds awesome. I'll probably try, I should do that as well, to do a week-long intensive in this place as well. Because hopefully... I think you should do like yeah. a regular course maybe. I mean, if you really don't want to travel that much anymore, this well, place is pretty... I might. It's hard. I don't promote myself locally for a number of reasons. People <laughs> here are in general kind of flaky. It's a, it's a town of transients, so like most people that live here are not from here. Uh -huh. And people go in and out a lot. So it's a difficult town to get any kind of consistent thing going. Yeah. Huh. So I'm going to host workshops here, but I don't know about a regular class. Well, in any case, um, go to his website, and I'm going to throw another one in for you, uh, talking about promotion. He has a great uh, wrist sequence that you can do to prevent injury and just to prepare yourself for really handstands. Good. Bigger forms. <laughs> and look jacked as he does. So I'm going to say it again. Go to his website. Um, and thank you so much for watching. Remember that the uh, world is your playground, so just go ahead and do whatever you love. And we're just going to go have some fun. I'll see you next Monday.